So I'm Mike Tweed again, and this is the second part of the Eagle and Layout tutorial. Last week we just did the tools involved in Eagle, so people learned how to use a CAD program. This time we're going to wrap up a little bit with the parts of the CAD program and then move on to more general uh, layout techniques. So again, just an overview. We're just going to wrap up. We're going to go through the steps you actually have to take to export files from a CAD program. In this case, we'll stick to Eagle, and we'll see how we actually submit them to a manufacturer. In this case, we'll use advanced circuits. Then I'll give a little short intro to SMD and SMT packages for people who are new to the whole surface mount technology thing. And after that, the rest of it will okay. all be devoted to various high speed. I'm looking at, looking at that screen, and you're looking at that screen. Why are you looking at that screen? Okay, so assuming we're in Eagle and we finished our design, or we think we finished our design, this is the checklist we go through. First, we have to make sure that our design rules are consistent with the design for manufacturing rules of the manufacturer. We get that from their website. And then we make sure that we have no DRC errors. Theoretically, that means we also have to agree with the manufacturer's rules. If we pass that, we also make sure we have no, e no big ERC warnings, especially no design inconsistencies. We also make sure that we've routed all our traces. And the best way to do that is to just turn off all the layers except the unrouted layer. And if we don't see any little yellow air wires anywhere, that means we've routed all our traces. And also, if we want a silk screen print, uh, printed, then we basically arrange any layers that we want to eventually be exported to the silk screen. Usually that's the names, values, place, documentation, and dimension layers. We'll go over that in the CAM process later. So Gerber files. Thankfully, somehow all the manufacturers and all the CAD program engineers decided, at least almost all of them, that there would be one set of design CAD files that we would use. And it's a big relief that there is, so I don't have to give this uh, tutorial 10 times for each manufacturer we ever. So the almost universal standard is called RS-274X, which is extended Gerber format. Gerbers are basically uh, text files that define a ton of vectors which draws a two-dimensional picture. And you'll have one Gerber file for each layer that you send to the manufacturer. Now since Gerber draws vectors and not points, the drill files will be in a separate folder because drills are just, you know, it's a coordinate and a size of the drill. So for that we have what's called an Excel on uh, file and that is also fairly universal. There's a bit more variance in those, but most manufacturers take Excel on. Uh, the CAM processor is Eagle's environment for exporting Gerber and Exelon files from your layout. So it's what, it's what we're going to go through now. Um, so this is a real step-by-step -step process. I'm going to go through it quickly now. You can overlook the slides at a later point. Basically, the CAM processor has two files that we can open. We see this is the CAM processor. We open up the files. This is the file or job file navigator menu. Each of these CAM files is a different job that we can do for exporting uh, Gerber files or Exelon files in different ways. So the tool we're interested in is GERB 274X, that's for two layer uh, layouts, and then there's Exelon, which is for general purpose Exelon file exportation. So let's do the uh, Gerber file exportation. First, we open up the win the uh, that job file, the GERB 274X one, and most of the work is already done for us. So we'll see at the top here, when we first open up, we'll see a bunch of tabs. These are, each of these tabs is a different layer file that will be exported as a Gerber file. And on the right, we'll see this column. This is every layer that exists in Eagle's layout environment. And the ones that are highlighted are the ones that will actually be exported to that Gerber file. We can export multiple uh, layers in the layout to the Gerber file. So most of the time, Eagle does the work for us, especially for the basic two-layer two, two layer design. The only thing we might want to mess around with is the silk screen layer, which is really you know, the artsy aesthetic layer where we can mess around with things that won't affect the design. So like I said before, we usually do the place, dimension, documentation, whatever. You gotta you got make sure you put your, uh, have your dimension on some layers so the manufacturer can see what the actual size of your board is and how your layout actually fits within those dimensions. Also, in the layout, always make sure that all your layers are enabled and visible before doing this. Otherwise, even if you uh, highlight them here, they won't be exported. Kind of a dumb bug in Eagle, but you gotta make sure that happens. For Exelon drill files, it's the same thing. You open up the other job file, and you only have one tab and only one uh, file to export. And this one, unless you really know what you're doing with setting the coordinate system and leading and trailing zeros and stuff, you should leave it as it is and just hit export. Okay, design files that you'll get out. 
Uh, for a normal two-layer design, you'll get a total of nine files. Not all of them are useful, but, but this is for a design that has two copper layers. It'll have solder mask on both sides and silk screen on both sides. So you'll get two copper layers, two solder mask layers, two silk screen layers, a drill file, and then you'll get two other files called DRI and GPI. Those are basically just like they're little text files that actually have words that you can read, unlike the other stuff. And they actually you can send them to the manufacturer and they'll say like, oh, this is our drill tool chain or whatever. But those aren't usually necessary. The manufacturer can tell uh, what's in those without actually looking at them. So what we do is we zip all those files up, up into a zip archive, and then we can actually send them to a DFM checker. Oh, but before that, we can actually preview the Gerber files using some freeware, which I've been using for a while. It's called ViewMate, made by Pentalogix. And this is uh, easy to use. It only allows you to view the software. We actually have a few uh, upgraded versions that allow you to edit uh, Gerber files, which is nice if you want to step and repeat and panelize designs so you can get one board with multiple copies. It's sometimes cheaper that way. But this is just nice to do a sanity check, make sure all your layers have actually exported to the Gerbers before sending them out for a real DFM check. Um, so for submitting our files, before we go to actually order them, it's highly recommended that you put them through an automated design for manufacturing rule check. Most manufacturers supply this as a free service. You send their files and they just put it through some uh, program that checks for all the clearances, all the spacings, all the sizes, make sure that it agrees with what they're expecting. Uh, we're going to be using advanced circuits as a DFM checker in their ordering process, and their free DFM checker is available at freedfm.com. So when we do this, we're going to, I'm going to read off the steps here, and I'm going to actually show the windows as we felt the information, but there's just a few steps. You go to their website, you put in your email address, and you upload a zip file because it'll be emailing you the results. Uh, you have to give them some information about the board outside of what's in the Gerber files, things like what's the dimensions, how many layers on this, which layer uh, Gerber file actually corresponds to what, like copper or solder mask layer. And then if you pass those, then you can actually go and do the manufacturing step, which we'll get to. So the DFM checker, First looks like this when you go to freedfm.com. Just a few lines, your email, your email again, and you upload the file, easy enough. So after you upload it, you're shown this interface. On the, this is uh, one very tall page, split to two section. Uh, on the left, the top of the page would be, this is just where we tell it which file name corresponds to which actual layer feature that they're paying attention to. So their DFM checker needs to know how to interpret your various names of your files. Okay, so we have top copper, NC drill, that just means Exelon drill. Uh, this is a four layer board, so I have two inner copper layers, and I say that the exposure is positive. Don't worry about that, it's all going to be positive. And these are layers two and three. There's silk screen, silk screen, and whatever that are those. There are nine layers right there, because I have a four layer design. Okay, on the right, here's the additional information. Things like you can actually put a part number and a revision number. That's, you have to fill it in, but it's not really useful unless you want to order the design and sell the revisions. You do that if you're a manufacturer and you're actually producing products. You have to definitely have to tell them how many layers you're putting on. Also, the X and Y dimensions that should match up with the layer uh, that really the dimension lines that you've drawn on the screwer files. You have to tell them how many. Uh, size of silk screen and solder mask on. Most of these are filled out correctly by default. You also have to tell them that it's yes or no ITAR. That's basically some weird military spec. You're always going to say no. So after that, you can just hit submit. After a while, you should get an email back. Sometimes it takes half an hour, sometimes it takes a day or whatever. It depends who's actually working and their computers there. But if all goes well, you'll get an email back with a lot of information on like, they'll give you quotes, they'll try to sell you stuff, whatever. But mainly, you'll get two big pieces of information. One will actually show you PDF images of what each layer looks like. So that should match up with what you saw if you previewed the Gerber files and also what you see in Eagle as well. So again, another layer of sanity check. And also show the also in, uh, all important DFM error report. And it divides into two categories. It'll give you showstoppers, and some problems automatically fix. That's if it's say it's like, oh, a silk screen line isn't really thick enough, but silk screen is silk screen, it doesn't matter, we'll make it bigger for you. 
So they do that a lot, and usually it's okay. You should always fix so showstoppers when they happen. That means that some trace is crossed or something is too close that they can't guarantee that it will work with their manufacturing tolerances. You all got, always got to uh, address those. But a lot of the, uh, like these 6,000 silkscreen line widths, don't worry about them. They'll, they'll take care of it themselves. So if you pass this, then you are ready to do the actual manufacturing step, which looks exactly like what we just did, except at the end you put a bill in information and they actually seriously fabricated it. Okay, so that is a quick 10 minute, I think, crash course on how to order. It's really easy, except for the whole waiting part and actually getting it wrong the first few times. But you get, it, after a while, you get good at that. So for people who are new to service mount devices, I whipped up a little preview of my recommendations for what to use. So this, I'm gonna start with leaded IC packages. Again, that, that has nothing to do with lead. This is, means they actually have metal leads that stick out, that's important. Uh, so on the left to the right, I've organized things in uh, order of like a wide pitch to fine pitch. Pitch being the spacing between the center of each pin. So the larger the spacing, the easier things are. The narrower the spacing, the tougher things are. So on the left, we have things like soft, so it, SOT23 in the middle, we get the 0.65 millimeters, which I think is the, it's okay if you're new to this, you can do it. Anything beyond that 0.5 millimeters, that's about as thin as leaded packages get. That you should get some magnification, you know, it's not like a, I say a microscope, but you don't actually, hear it. you're not looking at anything microscopic, but it helps a lot. And you better have some solder weight with you as well. So I'd say that if you're new, start over here. Maybe if you've got a microcontroller that you know you have no choice, you go with these. But until you're experienced, you should be sticking to the left of these graphs. So sometimes you really have, you can't avoid the unleaded package, or that should say unleaded. So this is really the same thing, except uh, the leads don't extend beyond the package body. This makes soldering them pretty difficult, especially if you don't have the right tools. Usually this requires hot air, maybe some flux, uh, and a lot of trial and error, steady hands. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So on the left, the biggest pitch you'll find these things is 0.65 millimeters. That's big for unleaded packages. Again, they, the whole unleaded thing means that you can stuff more pins in there because you don't have to like if you had actual pins, they'd be so thin and frail that they would just break all the time. So on the left, you have the famous QFN. A lot of MEMS devices, like the accelerometers and stuff, come in those packages. So. If you like MEMS and you like playing with accelerometers or remotes or whatever, you're going to be stuck with these, you know, nasty packages. And you got the cute, the DFNs with which there are like a hundred varieties, and they all have like really ridiculous round pads like these. It's annoying having to make a package for each uh, individual DFN. There. And then there's BGA. Uh, don't be a hero. If you have to do one of these, buy like uh, <laughs> buy a board that has everything broken out because you can't do this. Like it's, it's actually like uh, physically impossible without many layers on your board, at least for packages like this, where you have something like 100 pins per square You can't actually route the signals out. There's not enough room. So for our more basic components, the two terminal stuff, uh, for resistors, capacitors, and inductors, I like the 0805 size. And by the way, 0805 and all these other numbers over here, you can break them up into saying two numbers, Two digit sheets, like this is 0.4 millimeters by 0.2 millimeters. So that's pretty small. This is 0.8 by 0.5 millimeters. Sounds small, but it's actually fairly easy to work with. And also, it's big enough that you can read the numbers on the system. Very useful to actually be able to tell what the system is working with. The 603s have like codes on them, so even under a microscope, you need to look up the code. Yeah, until you like touch them and they disappear. Like some of them actually wipe off. It's yeah. Ridiculous. But yeah, that, I'd say that 0805 is the sweet spot, unless you need higher power dissipation or higher energy storage requirements. Again, like if, with these service mount packages, they're small and they have limitations on dissipation and energy. So you gotta pay attention to that too. For diodes, SOD 123 and 323, they're about, uh, they're around this size, maybe slightly bigger, and they're nice for any general purpose, small signal uh, diodes, you know, for just analog circuits. And for other things that require more power, there are all kinds of packages that do that. There's too many to get into right here. But for general, small signal, low power stuff, I recommend uh, these packages. Okay, so the real meat of the presentation. We're gonna talk about high-speed layout techniques. So 
I'm going to be going over techniques that are not valid for all high speeds because high is really a relative term. Like you can be uh, like some of my, the other Tesla coil guys define high frequency as anything above audio, then your Frank Merritt and there anything above five gigahertz is sort of high frequency. So but I'm saying that we're talking about the regime where we don't quite care about uh, in, uh, transmission line effects of signal traces, but we do care about things like skew and distortion, which are caused by some impedance mismatch. We'll get to that later. I'm going to say right here that I put uh, an effective range at 100 megahertz for analog signals and 50 megabits per second for digital signals. And keep in mind with digital signals, you don't just, it's not really the bit rate that determines it because you care about many harmonics of that fundamental frequency, especially for clock signals. And generally when I read up on this stuff, people say you've got to consider the ninth harmonic of the clock fundamental frequency. So if you got a 50 megahertz clock, then you're talking about circuits that must operate up to a band pretty well up to 450 megahertz. So you're suddenly an actual radio frequency ranges. But we don't, the tuning doesn't have to be perfect in that range. It just has to be okay. It's not totally destroyed its performance. So 450 megahertz bandwidth for digital signals is okay for this. So first we're gonna look, uh, I kind of divide things into how to uh, keep the integrity of intentional signals. Things like we want to send this signal some other part of the board, so let's make sure it doesn't get distorted or slowed down or whatever has all its bandwidth. I'm, and I'm going to start with those, those intentional signals, and we'll go to unintentional signals later on. So right from the, the back, you should assume that every high-speed trace is going to propagate as either a microstrip on the left or a strip line on the right if you have more than two layers. So microstrip is simply a trace above a very wide ground plane. You can assume it's infinite, but it never really is. But for our purposes, it's pretty close. And then for a strip line, it's a trace that's buried between two ground or not not necessarily ground planes, but reference planes. Basically, any uh, plane that is at a fixed potential. So a lot of our ability to get good high-speed design is our ability to, to keep track of current return paths. And I think of this example trace right here. So we've got a source and a load that's just a resistor. We can find the signal path to this red trace, which is on the top layer. Again, if you don't know, if you don't work with Eagle, this might look weird, but red is the top layer, blue is the bottom layer. So blue is just a very large ground plane, and the source and loads right here are connected to the ground plane through these green fields. That's what we see. So this is a microstrip, and I'm saying that we have a signal current that flows along this red trace. Sure, it has nowhere else to go. But what about with the return currents? Well, Mr. Circuits 101 says, oh, it takes the shortest path. It's the lowest impedance. It's the easiest. So that's good if you're Mr. Circuits 101. But at high speed, it doesn't work like that. Because you'll notice that uh, in this situation, we've drawn a very large current loop for this path. It goes all the way around. And then directly from one beat to the other, we have this large loop. And we know, or we should know, that impedance of a path is proportional to the inductance, at least the high frequency, which is going to be proportional to loop area. The more loop area we have, the more flux we self-induce, and the more inductance we have, the higher impedance and so on. So it doesn't actually flow along this path because it's a high impedance, even though it's the shortest path. What it does is it actually flows back beneath the signal trace. And you say, like, you know, why would it do that? It's a longer path, you know, it's just a longer total path. But the thing is, if it flows directly under that trace, then that magnetic fields are actually canceled out at the trace because there are two opposing currents flowing very, very close to each other. So this actually induces the least flux and has the least self-inductance and is the lowest impedance uh, path at high frequency. So this is the kind of current uh, path we're going to see. So this is kind of uh, another representation of that. Here we have, uh, give, give this a second to sink in. This is a cross section of the microstrip again. Here's the actual physical cross section, and up here we have three plots of current density that we see across there. First, at the bottom, we see the ground plane. We see that it's greatest underneath the trace, and it kind of drops off. That's kind of a Gaussian shape. It, you can basically think of it as uh, mainly being contained within, say, three strip loops. That's what it's shown here. And the other two plots show two currents on the trace. And then one thing I'll add is that since we're at high frequency, our skin depth is actually much shallower than the trace thickness. So we actually say that there are different uh, current densities. 
flowing on the top of the strip, which is a lot lower because it's away from the return currents, and the bottom of the strip. And actually, it's also concentrated towards the edge just because of self-inductance and anti currents. So things like that. But I just want to explain that this is the actual current distribution you'll see with a microstrip at high frequencies. And they also, they always try to run back underneath the current. Okay. So what if we do something stupid? We put a notch in our ground plane, ground plane underneath the trace. Well, the signal wants to, still wants to flow under the current trace, or the signal trace. It's going to want to, but it's not going to be able to. It's going to, the return current in blue is going to have to flow and take a detour around this notch. And that widens the loop area, creates a higher impedance, and worst of all, probably, is this loop will induce additional fields in the air and will also be able to receive other fields. So you have a couple of issues with it where you're like, emitting and receiving additional fields because of this open loop being caused. Also, we have to talk about the importance of bypass capacitors uh, and the role they play in forming small current loops. So here I've got an example of a simple logic gate and inverter driving a resistive load or can be any type of load, and it's powered by some five volt source that's located somewhere, not really close, somewhere far away. And we have to realize that inside this gate, there's not a magic battery or voltage source that turns on or off. A logic gate is just a set of switches that can direct current either from the source or to ground. So it looks like this. Here we have you know, some control signal closing these complementary switches. You know, anyone who you knows CMOS will know exactly what this is. In this state, the top switch is closed, so it's conducting from the supply to the load. So in this case, we have a long current path that flows all the way from the source to the load through that gate. Now, at high frequency, we could out, uh, actually redirect it with a bypass capacitor. So let's put it right next to the gate, far away from the source, and we'll actually get current, path that, current paths that flow through that capacitor because capacitors should be nice low impedances at high frequency. Current paths or currents will flow through them easily, especially if there's a little inductance on this line, which they're usually low. So just by placing the bypass capacitor there, we shorten this loop area a lot. And usually this is not to scale. Usually we have one voltage supply that you know deals with a dozen ICs or so, so it'll be far away from a lot of them. You need bypass capacitors to keep these current loops manageable. So bypass capacitors are never perfect. Every capacitor has some effective series inductance, which causes uh, series self resonance So here on the right, you see that we have several different uh, capacitor values. Also, it kind of says what size they have. So we see that for larger values, these dips right here are the self resonant frequency. We see the impedance magnitude drops, and then it starts to rise as, it start, as the inductance starts to take over. So each of these capacitors is only really effective as a bypass capacitor. The capacitor below its uh, self resonant frequency. But if we want a low impedance that's very broadband, then what we have to do is basically combine several different capacitors of different sizes, different packages to get a nice broadband low impedance. Uh, also, we, I don't, I, think it, I don't think it says over here, it says some RF types. That basically means we're talking about tiny 0402 SMD packages, some with four leads or whatever, Kelvin connections or something. Basically, smaller capacitor packages will have lower self-inductance and then we'll have some, uh, higher self resonant frequency. So you should have a mix of tiny, tiny uh, low capacitance capacitors and then some larger uh, high, uh, lower self resonant frequencies, you know, frequency capacitors to get a good balance. Another concept I want to mention is uh, stitching capacitors, but I want to mention this with some caution uh, afterwards. So if we have this split in the ground plane, let's say we're forced to do it. Someone put a gun to our head, force us to split the ground plane or run a trace over it, that we can kind of uh, get away with it if we provide a return current path with a stitching capacitor, which basically means the bypass capacitor that goes between two points on the same plane. It sounds stupid, but at high frequency, it can make a lot of sense when you have something like this because this capacitor should be about a short circuit at high frequency, so it allows those return currents to flow where they want to, right next to that trace. Pretty close to this. They'll never be actually as good as having a continuous ground plane, but it helps a lot. 
The thing is, if we have two ground planes that we want isolated, then this destroys in that isolation. This is horrible if, say, those two planes, like one of them is a digital supply that has lots of broadband digital noise on it, and the other is an analog supply, which you want to keep clean. So this uh, solution is usually not acceptable in cases where we have two planes which need to stay isolated at high frequencies. This is a compromise, and we should avoid having to make that compromise when possible. Another thing we got to not fall for is when signals change layers. Everybody likes to route uh, signals between layers when it's convenient, but it gives rise to problems because when you, a signal changes layer, its return current has to change layers too. So here I actually have a picture that's actually from a four layer design. I couldn't find a good one for a two layer design. But, so what we have here is the green planes are both reference planes, one gonna be ground or power, it doesn't matter. We're just thinking of that as high frequency uh, current return paths. And we have this blue signal path that's going from the top layer to the bottom layer. The two inner layers are both the reference planes. This is a common way to stack up our four layer board. So if we look carefully, we can see that, let's say the, our current, our trace current is coming from the left top and going down to the bottom towards the right. The return current on the top plane wants to flow back there, but once it gets to that via, it can't flow directly between these planes unless we put some kind of current path between the two reference planes, which may or may not be actually at the same potential. If they are at the same potential, then we can put a via nearby, and those return currents will happily flow to that via between the two planes and complete the circuit. This isn't great because we still have to do some more loop area with that other via, but for our speed, this is usually okay. What it won't work is when these two planes are not at the same potential. And we can't, of course, just short the planes together if one's, you know, a 5 volt and the other is a 3.3 volt. We can't do that with a via. So we have to get even more complicated and use a stitching capacitor as it applies to uh, uh, switching reference levels now. So kind of absorb this. It's messy. We'll go over a bit more later. But here we're basically looking at, again, uh, this current going from the top left to the bottom right. Return current wants to fall on this plane but can. So what it has to do is come from the stitching capacitor we put between the two inner layers right there. So it comes all the way from this inner layer there and it also has to come all the way around this edge of that bottom layer. And also, so you might say that, oh, these currents cancel out and actually just flow directly through there. No, again, skin effect. We actually flow along one side of this copper layer and then along the other side of the other copper layer. And this all is part of the current. So this is not a great compromise. Stitching capacitors don't work that well for multiple layers. So we really want to avoid switching reference layers when doing, uh, especially four layer designs for high speed signals. We should just not do it until we learn better ways to deal with it. So when we run into these issues, there are a few things we can do. One is differential signaling. So differential signaling means that for each uh, logic signal, say, or analog signal, we send two signals, which are complementary. For digital, one is high, the other is low. For analog, they'll be biased around some common mode voltage, and their differential voltage will be the actual signal level. This is great because uh, one of those traces will be a signal current, and the other will provide the return current and ideally, no current flows through the reference planes that they're above, usually. It usually uh, maybe reduces it by a factor of 10 because the cancellation is not perfect. To get good cancellation, those, tra those traces need to be routed right alongside each other. The closer, the better. The more attenuation of the return currents you get. Um, and also, this is not perfect, though this uh, eliminates uh, currents that are induced in the ground plane via, uh, you guys okay? Yeah. Come on. It's it's not cooperating. Okay. Let's keep going. So although it, these differential currents won't induce a uh, return to the reference plane, this still presents a common mode signal path. Like let's say if this gate's ground jumps a little bit higher than this grade uh, than this uh, gate's ground, then we will get common mode currents flowing from one to the other. So do not think of this as isolation. Think of it as attenuation of differential signals and return currents. Big difference. Oh, so that's the 
that's the actual current path. So we see that we flow from one to the other, and we don't induce any current, ideally, in the ground. So if that doesn't work, we and we have to get actual isolation, there are a couple things we can do. Basically, uh, isolation will always take the form of either optical isolation, or we have an LED and a phototransistor, or a uh, photodiode. This is called an optocoupler. This is really nice isolation. There'll be maybe one or two picofarads between these two. That's pretty good, even at really high frequencies. And then nowadays, uh, analog devices especially has pushed uh, magnetic isolators, where they actually do this decoding scheme, where they send ultra wideband pulses across an integrated transformer. It's pretty crazy, but they claim they claim really good specs at really low power. So I threw that in there because it's nice emerging technology. So the downsides of this are that there's always propagation delay along the usually it's on the order of one to ten nanoseconds, maybe maybe faster for really high speed optocouplers. And of course the packages are often large because they house large isolation barriers and integrated transformers which are inherently large in size. They're kind of costly. Sometimes they increase power consumption a little bit. But there are some advantages that come in. Uh, like a lot of times you can use these for logic level translation, going from a 3 volt supply to a 5 volt supply. They can do those easily. It's just part of the isolation. Uh, and also, what having actual isolation is really important when you actually say, hook this thing up to a USB connector or an Ethernet connector, because even if you make a nice internally uh, built layout, if you connect it to something that's carrying weird common mode currents, then none of that's going to save you. You actually need isolation on a lot of your I.O. ports to have them function effectively. So this is uh, very worthy to consider if you're interfacing with some serial connection like Ethernet or, I don't know, a CAN if you're into automotive stuff, things like that. So big signal design. Uh, now we can talk about this. It's basically any kind of system that has both analog and digital systems if you have a DAC or an ADC on your board, then you have mixed signal design inherently. Also, a comparator can actually be considered a one-bit ADC, so you can kind of apply these rules there too. So before we were talking about how to preserve intentional signals, we have a signal that we want to go from point A to point B. We want to get there and it's return currents there without slowing it down. With mixed signal design, we have two systems which have very different bandwidths, very different signals that we do not want to talk to each other. So here we want to prevent unintentional signals from talking, from forming between two systems. So it's kind of the other side of the coin. So our goal, again, with mid signal design is that when we have uh, the two systems operating with overlapping bandwidths, which is almost always the case because digital signals have huge bandwidths, and usually your analog systems will not be much higher or lower than that. So you have to keep them from talking directly to each other. Um, we, we have two methods, or we have two modes of interaction between these. One is conduction, conducted interference, which comes in the form of common mode currents in our ground planes and also in our power supplies. And then there's field interference, which is electric, uh, electric and magnetic fields that actually couple through the air or through the dielectric of the PCB and make the signals talk to each other. So for this, I made a little design example using an ADC from Texas Instruments, I think, ADS8329. I'm using this in a design right now, so I just threw it in there. So we have a 3.3 volt digital supply and 5 volt analog supply. It operates with a 25 megahertz SP interface, nothing crazy. Uh, external analog shunt reference voltage, you'll see that in a bit. We'll connect to it on the digital side with a 9-pin header, which has all our digital signals, and also the power supply is coming in. And on the analog side, we'll have an SMC connector, which is a little, a, a small coax connector, just for the analog signal. So here's a schematic of what it looks like. Here's my custom Eagle part for the ADC. So we, we, so we see some uh, supply symbols, digital 3.3 volts, analog 5 volts. We see that all the ground connections, I've given them the same name, because they are going to be the same plane. They have each have their bypass capacitors for the uh, digital and analog supplies. And here I have this is a shunt reference. It's basically just a really, really nice inner diode that's really precise with its own bypass capacitor. So 
oh, and here's the SMC connector, we'll fit to Young Terminator, why not? Like so here's what the layout looks like. Again, we have the digital on the left side, analog on the right, and it's real simple. So we have the uh, bypass capacitors very close to the supply pins. We have what's called a ferrite bead, which I'm going to go over next, I think, uh, bridging this gap in the, here I'll actually show this now, this is what the ground plane looks like by itself. We see that we've joined the two partitions together underneath the ADC, but created a gap, everything else. This confines all the return currents to one space, which is nice, because then we're not inducing our uh, currents anywhere else except one point. It's nice to be able to control things like that. If I go back, we see that all my high speed signals, this is the actual SPI signals plus a couple other control signals, actually going just directly from the header to the supply pins. And all the, they, they thought this out when they made this chip. All the digital pins are on one side of the IC, all the analog pins are on the other side. That's how it should be. They all go directly from the header to the pins without switching traces or anything. So, uh, oh yeah, also the reference must be grounded on the analog side. Very important. Also, the bypass capacitors, like the analog one, is grounded to the analog supply. And so, same with the digital, it's grounded to the digital supply. So, on these two partitions, at RF, or at very high frequencies, there will be difference in voltages between them, but that's okay because the bypass capacitors are each reference to their respective analog and digital sides. So, again, we can further partition our design if we have multiple analog or multiple digital sections. Like here we have three ADCs and three analog sections. Let's say we just want to copy and paste that design and use all those side by side. Adding these extra slots in here kind of cre uh, creates subpartitions which prevent currents from flowing between one analog section and the other, or at least from creating high uh, low impedance so now these analog sections should be more independent to overuse uh, crosstalk between all of them. So uh, somehow a lot of people get the idea that when you do this partition, you split the ground plane, and you can kind of put slots in the ground, ground plane, but you really only have one ground plane. A lot of people get the idea that you actually have two completely like separate uh, planes that if you were to put a you know a DMM between them, you read it and clean it. That's never how it is. If you do, you're going to run into a lot of trouble because on the ADCs and DACs, usually they will have analog and digital supply pins, and those supply pins are not internally connected to each other usually, but they really have to be external. Uh, it's not like there's an isolated supply inside the ADC that allows those two sub, uh, ground pins to float with respect to each other. They have to be tied closely together. So you always have one ground plane, or at least in almost all cases, but it's not about when you see you split the ground plane, you just partition. You separate it into regions across which on this side you have analog, on the other side you have digital, and the two signal currents do not communicate with each other. So like we just saw, uh, one typical way to do it is to only join those two partition ground planes underneath their ADCs or DACs or whatever. And also, if we have signal traces, that must cross from the digital to analog side or vice versa, they must do so only over those joints because again, the return currents want to flow along the plane. So if the cross is split in the plane that it's not uh, under the ADC, then we'll create more loops like we did way back. So uh, one concern people that have is, okay, I need one ground plane for everything. What if, like in the previous example, I have an analog and a digital supply one is 3.3 volts, one's 5 volts. For that, I need two regulators to generate two DC voltages. But what if one, they could both run on 3.3 volts? Do I need two separate 3.3 voltage regulators? The answer is no, but you need to make sure that those two supplies are choked or isolated from each other at high frequency so that supply rail doesn't form a current loop at high frequency. So I'm going to show you how to simply do this. On the left, we have a, say, 12 volt supply coming into a three terminal regulator, you know, like LM7805. So, first we route it to the digital signals, it could be the analog signals, and then we also route it through a ferrite bead to analog. And these both have their individual bypass capacitors. 
So what this ferrite bead is, really I'll have a slide on this later on, is it's kind of like an inductor. It's high impedance at high frequency, low impedance at DC. It passes DC very easily, but it's high impedance at high frequency. That's all you need to know for now. So at high frequency, what we'll actually see is this split still between the ground planes. This ferrite bead does not conduct high frequencies. So it forms a full loop from being formed from the analog to the digital portions. Again, this ground plane is continuous, but that's only one current path. You need a loop to actually form uh, differential current paths, which can cause interference in EMI and stuff. So the two current paths and then these should be separated. This, these bypass capacitors form a current loop in the digital system. This, these bypass capacitors form a loop of the analog system. You also need bypass capacitors on both sides, so there's a good high frequency current reservoir for each of the systems because that, uh, if you didn't have this C3 right here, then you'd be in trouble on the analog side because that ferrite bead would block any high frequency supply current from making it to whatever is over here. So whenever you divide or you choke, you've got to restore the low impedance on supply rails on both sides. So again, a little more about ferrite beads. They're nice uh, as a way kind of conversely to bypass capacitors, which Merely allow high frequency current to flow through them. Ferrite beads prevent high frequency current from flowing. So, again, the theme of this mixed signal design section is preventing unintentional signals. That's what ferrite beads are for. They're high impedance at higher frequencies, but they are not inductors. They're not nice linear, you know, components that have some imaginary impedance that's proportional to frequency. They, can't, they just get high impedance at high frequency, but they also get really high resistance at high frequency. The real uh, component of their complex impedance becomes high as well. And this is actually nice because if it were completely uh, imaginary, if they were actually inductors, then we would get all these really nice high quality factor ringing circuits. It would be resonating all over the place. Whenever we get a digital transition, we just get high frequency ringing on our supply rail, and that would suck. So ferrite beads are nice because they kind of are not good inductors. But they, they do their job. They form a high impedance of, let's say, 30 ohms. It's a lot higher than you can get ones that are impedances up to a kilo ohm at 100 megahertz or 10 megahertz or whatever. So those are useful for blocking high frequency currents, especially in power supply cases. So considerations for a switch mode power supply, because switch mode power supplies are analog uh, portions and they're particularly nasty because even if they don't operate set operate you know 50 megahertz or whatever the magnitude of the EMI that they can generate is so great that they're, they're like their 20th harmonic can easily dominate whatever is out there so here's a boost converter that I've drawn and we have this very very high DIDT current loop that's formed by the MOSFET rectifier diode and this uh, bypass capacitor out here and we also have at this node, this is the drain of the MOSFET, a very high DBDT. This might be, like in, this is a circuit that I have on. This is going from zero to, I think, 24 volts, and it goes at about, I think, 50, no, 100 volts per microsecond slew rate. And this is going at about, I think, 20 amps per microsecond slew rate on current. So it only operates at like 500 kilohertz, but those slew rates, will cause a lot of havoc if you allow these fields to propagate and couple to other parts of the circuit. But here's what that layout looks like. First thing I'm going to point out uh, on the lower right, this is the transistor, the MOSFET, this is the diode, bypass capacitor, and there's this little current sense resistor, which isn't really important for this. But uh, you can see that this current loop right here is minimized by putting all these components in a nice tight loop. And again, that loop area being small minimizes the inductance, minimizes the field that it generates. There. Also, you'll notice that uh, connected to the drain of the this is that high DVDT node, which will be radiating all kinds of electrical field traffic. It will be trying to capacitively couple everything around it. Uh, I have it large so that it can thermally heat sink that transistor if necessary. But I prevent those fields from coupling to other parts of the circuit by putting all of this on the opposite side of the board. So I actually use the ground plane as a shield. So everything else is on the other side of the ground plane. So Ever, all of those uh, flux lines should turn, terminate at the ground plane and not interfere with everything on the other side. So that's how we usually deal with switch mode power supplies, so long as we know. So 
beyond two-layer design. At some point, we get uh, with our two-layer designs and we have to do things like cross, uh, we have to rough traces from one side of the board to the other, we have to switch reference planes, or we just don't have enough room for everything on one side of the board, and we have to move to four layers. So here's one of the uh, most common, well, it's really the uh, four-layer stack-up. So not to see other stack-ups, but this is pretty much it. So four layers in yellow, two inner layers are both reference planes, one is usually a ground plane, the other is a supply plane. And the supply plane is basically any positive or negative supply that isn't ground. Usually we'll have multiple supplies partitioned on it. But the ground plane is totally solid, except for a little partition notches we put in it. And on the top and bottom, you'll have microstrip traces that can run in any orientation you want. So, oh yeah, also this uh, drawing is not the scale. The spacing between these layers is not always uniform. We can actually ask the manufacturer to do crazy things with it. And it's important because these uh, spacings often form important capacitances, a high frequency, like these two power planes being solid, being next to each other. That's a nice distributed, very low impedance capacitor. There's nothing better than an airport capacitor. It's awesome. So those being close together helps with that. So again, with this picture, we're gonna take a little closer look at it. Uh, four layers sounds really great. It allows you to have that nice inner layer for routing uh, your positive and negative supplies. That helps a lot because when those are on two layer boards, they eat up a lot of your area and a lot of your via uh, count. And having that on the inner layer kind of just gets rid of that problem. And also, since you can now have traces and components on the top and bottom layers without destroying your ground plane, that allows you to get much higher density. But unfortunately, uh, the four layer design doesn't afford much beyond that in terms of high speed design because in the stack of again, whenever we change a signal from the top layer to the bottom layer, we have to cross two reference planes. And that it forms a large return loop. No matter what we do, no matter where we put the stitching capacitor, it's always going to add, you know, five or ten nano henrys of impedance, which at higher uh, bandwidths is just going to skew our signals. You'll see your signals have ringing in them, or have slow edges. Sometimes you'll see reflections and re-reflections coming if your traces are really long. But in general, forward layer design is good for density, but not for high speed if you have to have your signals change supply, the, uh, change layers. If you can do it without having your signals having to go through vias, then it's great. You don't have any problems because they're both sticking to one reference plane all the time. But if you need to go and switch layers, you just have that much density, you have that many digital lines that are going to that many peripherals, you usually have to step it up straight to six layers. So six layers, we have more options in the way we do our stack up. Here's one of the more common ones. It's kind of hard to see in two dimensions, but uh, basically the top three layers and the bottom three layers are the same thing sandwiched together. So each of them is one inner, uh, power plane, either zero or positive for negative supply. Or one is going to be zero volts at ground, the other is going to be, again, all the supply non-ground voltages. And on one side, the two uh, other layers are both going to be signal layers, and you're going to say, like, whoa, whoa, these signal layers are overlapping each other, they're going to do crazy things, they're going to cross that. But we always make sure that the signal layers on one layer are always orthogonal to the ones on the bottom layer, meaning they run at 90 degree angles to each other. So we actually partition, say the top layer, to only run traces going north-south, and the other one to only to east-west. And that way, you can have any trace going from point A to point B, theoretically, by jumping between those signal layers. Even if you take a lot of jumps, the nice thing is that when you jump between layers one and two, or between layers five and six, you never change reference point. You're always, like uh, when you're on layers one and two, you're always referenced to the zero point. Things mess up at hot, really high frequencies because your characteristic impedance changes between these two traces or whatever, but again, it's not our regime that we're working in. So this is a nice uh, way to use a six layer design. Now there's another way to do this, uh, slightly different. So in this we have, again, two kind of symmetrical groups of three traces, or three layers. Uh, the power planes, again, there's two of them, but they're each buried um, between signal layers. So here, we have kind of two three-layer boards which operate mostly independent. So layers one and three, 
use layer two as a reference plane, layers four and six use layer five as a reference plane. And here we can jump between layers one and three and not have to change reference plane. And we don't also need to return uh, via because it's still the same plane and also the same retention. We don't have to worry about crazy return curves. And also we don't have to worry about the thing with the second one where we jump and say this layer and this layer and the characteristic impedance of our microscope strip changes because both these layers are equally spaced from the reference plane. The downfall of this, or not the downfall, but the downside of this one is that with these two inner uh, signal layers, if they don't run orthogonal to each other, then they will cross dot because there's no shield in between these. So you gotta be careful with it. But both of these have their ups and downs. I see them both all the time. Um, and this is, these are the two stackers you have to use. If you have high density, uh, high part count, high speed digital or analog system. There's really no way you could do that with a four layer board where you absolutely need to change signal layers from time to time. So this is the kind of the minimum for that. Um, and also from here, of course, it goes up to eight layers and beyond. You need even more and more things to get it done. Or sometimes you don't. Some people are really spoiled and just have 12 layers all the time. Mm -hmm. I have stories about, about agile intention as you can tell, but uh, save that for later. Oh, I, I kind of forgot to mention, but with these, you can't route between, say, signal uh, layer one and layer five, or layer one and layer four. That's a big no-no because there you are crossing reference points. You just have pairs of signal traces that can route between each other. Again, here you can't route between one and six or one and four because there you are changing reference points. You just have pairs of layers that can switch between each other. Big difference. And also, some places do offer three layer boards. You can do nice high-speed designs on a three-layer board because then you have enough that you can change trace uh, levels, or you can, you can change layers without changing reference points. And it works really nice. You just have one ground plane, no power plane. Sometimes that works. And I've seen really nice like Ethernet modules on three layer boards that run at grids. It's kind of amazing. So getting to conclusions. Uh, really, really, when we talk about high speed design in general, not just mixed signal, we're talking about controlling current paths and also current return paths. I want you guys to recognize that you don't look at your traces. You look at your traces and the return current paths and the reference plane that you form because those return currents are just as important. You have to minimize the impedance of an, uh, intended current paths and you have to maximize the impedance of unintended current paths. And also you have to minimize the field coupling uh, caused by certain parts such as uh, switching power supplies which can couple through the air, either through magnetic or electric fields. When you go to decide how many layers you want, it's mainly a requirement of what kind of speed you need, what kind of component count and density you have. There's totally no reason why you can't do an extremely high frequency design at two layers. In fact, as you go to, high, to very, very high speed, especially in the analog land, you don't see anything but two layers. Like all the, you know, uh, gigahertz and stuff, up level stuff, it's all one layer with controlled impedance and stuff. Very low density, though. but if that's fine for you, let's stick with two layers, why not? Um, moving to four layers is nice because it allows for higher density because you can mount components on both sides. You have an extra layer to route uh, power traces, and you also have more signal area, too, since you don't have to worry about interrupting your ground plane with signal traces. But for high speed, you really have to look at, uh, for, for high speed and high density, you have to look at six uh, layer boards because they allow you to change uh, signal layers without changing return current paths. Also, for mixed signal design, it's not about part, like uh, really dividing your ground plane or splitting your ground plane. People talk about that a lot when they think of that mixed signal design. It is mainly about component placement. It's about just separating current return paths by putting analog stuff in part, uh, uh, part A and digital stuff in part B and power supply stuff in part C. If you do that, then most of the work gets done for you automatically. Uh, we do not split ground plans completely. We partition them again, either with slots sometimes if we think it helps for these cross stock. Again, that's not even mandatory unless we really have a specific idea of what currents we're trying to prevent it from flow. We can also subpartition analog portions if we have 
multiple inputs and outputs and things like that, and crosstalk for analog and digital partitions can share supply rails. Uh, thankfully, because it'd be annoying to have separate regulators for every single partition, we have to use ferrite beads in addition to bypass capacitors to try and isolate them at high frequencies while within each partition preserving the high frequency performance. And so that's all I had lined out for today. Any questions? What's the process that you go through when selecting ferrite beads and capacitors? Does it easily see a situation where you pick them like so the resonance? No, re no resonance. Yeah, so you look, you want to see much higher looking back into the ferrite bead than you see going into your bypass capacitor. You know, to, and you have you can't start with nothing. You have to say I want a number, you know, of attenuation of my supply currents. Like I want uh, like 99% of my currents to be confined to this loop. 1% can flow back into the ferrite bead. So you say my ferrite bead has to be 100 times the impedance of my by bypass capacitors. And then you do the circuit analysis to find that way. Generally they make insanely high uh, frequent, uh, high impedance ferrite beads. And they're not even big either. So that's usually not a problem. It's mainly the bypass capacitor being low enough impedance that they don't affect your signal propagation and speed. That's mainly the trouble. You can do that with 10 microfarad capacitors pretty easily. What? You can do that with 10 microfarad capacitors pretty easily. Uh, Imagine up the ferrite beads or bigger. For for preventing the signal from going back to the ferrite bead, sure. But from having a low impedance path for the signals within the partition to flow freely. Ferrite bead is about preventing currents from escaping. Yeah. But from actually allowing currents to flow within the partition, you still need a low impedance, not just a high impedance to other signal paths. See what I'm saying? So you need, you know, I get it. Let me go back to the self resonance plot. So if you're operating at, say, 100 megahertz and you've got this, you know, 10 nanofarad up here, this is not going to act like a reliable source. You know, 10 ohms. That's probably, you know, if you're operating at 100 megahertz, you're at 3 picofarads of input capacitance on that pin of that DDR ramp. It's probably going to be less than 10 ohms. So you, it's not about the ferrite bead, it's about getting that impedance here down so that capacitor does not act like an attenuator to your digital signal high frequency. Because yeah. it's in series with your signal. It really is. When you look at the full closed loop, it's in series with your signal. And that can be a dominating factor in your frequency. Anything else? Okay. Um, if you can get all of your components onto one side of the board, would it make sense to make, uh, on a four layer board, would it make sense to have a power plane on an outer layer? What would you put there? What power plane? I mean, if you got like 20 supply plant, there are 20 uh, power supplies, then sure, it, it can work. But the thing is, uh, when you look at the stack up, yeah, that would... you've, you've got one ground plane, and you're only going to have one ground for your circuit. Uh, where is this? So you're going to have one ground for your circuit, and if, if one extra layer of pure power supplies is enough, then you can use a third layer for what signals or whatever. I mean, if you have yeah. signals on there, what, then putting components on there is probably no issue. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, if you flip the third and fourth layer here, so that you would have the signal on the inside. Oh, okay. So some people do that. So I see that done, where people have very high frequency clock signals, and the clock signals are important. Uh, people like putting them in strip lines, like we saw way back on slide one. So let's see. So strip lines right here. This is nice because any signal that's in a strip line will have pretty much no radiation. They really will isolate high frequency. So if you can put ground planes on both sides of that for a clock signal, that preserves its integrity really well, prevents it from communicating with everything else. So that's one uh, reason in a four layer board, if you were able to put the components there, and all the traces there as well, because on on this bottom plane, if like say this is layers two, three, four, then this should be a solid ground plane, at least for the area where that trace is propagating. If you can put fit most of the traces and all the components on the top layer, then sure that'll help in this situation where you really want to prevent that signal from talking to anything else. 
And I do see that sometimes with four layer designs, but generally if you have that, for people who have that high frequency clock, it's correlated with having complexity. And the complexity is enough to use that other layer for other things, and they usually would have to step it up to a six layer design. Not always though. Anybody else? Is it advantageous for like shielding purposes to just fill in everything that's not being used for routing on your outer layers with ground plane? That's a good question. Uh, so I ran into that a lot, and the thing I, I was gonna have a slide prepared where I took one of my newer designs uh, and filled in the top layer with a copper pour, and it basically they're like you can't even tell the difference. There are so few places where the copper can actually pour that it. it doesn't really affect much. So you can see oops, from my example layout right here. So right here, these are all ground pins. They just drop into via directly in the ground plane. That's usually the same amount of impedance you get with it, with just a little pour there. It doesn't actually help that much. The way the reasons you would want to put a ground pour on the top of bottom layer is usually for thermal reasons. Okay. So say this tab right here, like this chip, dissipates a decent amount of power, you can use that as a thermal heat <coughs> because the inner layer do not provide good thermal performance at all. You need some outer copper to actually provide that. If you have lots of area available on the top layer, then I'd say yes, do that, and make sure you populate it with lots of ground vias to make it a low impedance connection. But yes, it can be bad in some situations, especially at high frequencies in a high EMI environment. A lot of things can act like pickups to high frequency, especially like say if I were to fill in this gap right here, then that'd be a nice uh, monopole antenna or something. Yeah, so instead of getting shielding, you'd actually end up with an antenna. Right, so look for the purpose, look for the current paths, and just say to yourself, does this provide an intentional current path, or does it provide an unintentional and depending on the answer, you can add it or not. But you should just be careful. Usually, this is why I say put one large current plane, so it can't act like an antenna. At least a big current, a big ground plane shouldn't. It's not a good impedance match there. Anyone else? Thank you.